Okay. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our uh, What's New in FME 2023 webinar. I um, uh, hope you're all well. We're just about to get going. Um, with me this morning, uh, just myself, Kieran Kirk, I'm the Operations Director, and Gavin Park, our CTO, is here as well. Hey, Gavin, how are things? Morning. Uh, so, um, yeah, everybody seems to be just jumping in now. So, we just give a second to a few other people joining. So we let everybody get online and then we'll get going now on uh, what's new in FME 2023. There's a lot of new stuff, Gavin. So we're only, we're only going to focus on some of the things that you've highlighted, some of the key uh, areas and, and also what's coming, the 2023.1 release as well. So we're, we're now, it, it, it's a, a, the what's good this year's release, isn't it really? Yeah. we. Yep, so we should have chosen all the stuff that's probably going to be useful for people and relevant. So hopefully it's all the key features. There's so much in there in the last couple of releases. So yeah, it's hard picking everything. So we've kind of narrowed it down to the useful bits, or at least the bits we think will be useful to people yeah, and that you yeah. might miss as well for some of them. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah, I think everybody's joined now, so we'll get going. Um, so uh, data is the most critical business asset for any organization. And uh, so with Safe Software, we believe that we serve customers better with data-driven decisions. And uh, the safe differentiators are that the deliver value are naturally FME and Safe Software is the geospace, number one for geospatial enter enterprise integration. So it's a market leader in that environment. The second thing is FME provides a no code environment that delivers unrivaled productivity. So you can build all these workflows we're going to talk today without having to write a line of code. Now, with, uh, more and more with the latest releases of FME, um, we can deploy it anywhere, wherever you want and however you want to use it. We'll talk a little bit about that later this morning. And Safe Software believe in the restaurant model, which is in that not only do they want to provide an excellent product, but they also want to provide excellent service for post go live and when you're using the system. And finally, now with the move towards enterprise licenses with FME, you get all every system, all the system capability you want in the, in the product. So this year we've seen a move away from the old FME database, FME Esri, FME Node Locked to actually just you've got FME Form and you've FME Flow, and they're the products, and you get all the functionality. So Safe Software have been innovators in spatial data since 1993. They bring the power of spatial data to your decision making, and we've all seen that over the years. As I've mentioned now, we have one platform and two technologies. So FME Form allows you to build and run your data workflows. So you're forming your workflows, forming the data pipelines. FME Flow then helps you to automate the flow of these pipelines. And of course, FME Flow hosted is the cloud version of FME Flow. And just to kind of remind people how these product names have changed. So what was FME Desktop is now FME Form. What was FME Server is now, well, I should say FME Flow, where it says Flow Flow there. Um, and what uh, was FME Cloud is now FME Flow hosted. And FME Mobile is still running around there. So on the ecosystem, um, SAFE, as we've mentioned already, have the largest geospatial ecosystem and an unfair advantage in geospatial, which we've always had and delighted to have. With the new releases this year, we've, we've always, with FME, we get new data formats supported every year, and, and this year's no difference. So we've got Airtable, support for ArcGIS feature server, feature server writer, uh, cloud optimist, optimized GeoTIFF, Databricks, again, you know, really uh, something we, we have been working with, uh, excellent um, cloud data warehouse for machine learning, but also for storage, really improving in the last few years. Flat Geo Buff, I think we talked about before at our at our uh, data conference. Generative AI Reader, again, Gavin will talk a little bit about that today. Um, Microsoft Azure Synapse SQL, again, another cloud data warehouse. ND JSON and ND Geo JSON, precisely MRR Writer, Revit Writer, again, Gavin will talk briefly on that. Uh, Trimble Connect for the, again, some more new mobile and hundreds of new items on the FME hub and countless updates across the system. So again, FME just has unrivaled connectivity, supporting all modern platforms and modern formats. Right, Gavin, I'll, I'll hand over to you now and 
you can actually go through some of the key new features that uh, are coming this year. So hopefully you can see that screen. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Um, so one of the new ones that is held is there's also geo parquet now. So we've talked a little bit in the past about parquet. Um, what it really is and why this is quite a good one is that it's a replacement for things like CSV. So CSV has been really, really popular for decades. Um, it's probably one of the most common data formats you can use. But as the, you get into big data, it just doesn't perform as well. You know, it's quite verbose. It can take a lot of time to actually process a lot of data. So, you know, it's fine for hundreds of thousands, you know, a couple of million records. But as you start to move up into much, much bigger data sets, um, it's not so efficient. So, um, the Open Apache Consortium have come up with Parquet, which I've me supported for a while, and they've recently extended that to include a geospatial element so that you can store geospatial in there as well. So we can now bring that data in. Um, one of the real big benefits for this, and just one of the reasons for calling it out, is that you can see the performance difference there. So we're reading about 4.5 million records in from a traditional CSV file. You know, it's taking about 25 seconds. Now, it's using a reasonably decent amount of CPU system time there to bring that data in. Same data set in the Parquet format. In fact, this one's the Geo Parquet, so it's got the points as well alongside this. You know, we can read that into FME in 1.4 seconds, so it's a big performance game. And again, as we scale this up to tens of millions of features, you know, you're going to really start to notice that performance coming in as well so if you're looking at big data you're struggling a little bit with csv um, this is definitely one to have a look at um, as we go through um, the other one just to call out fme's had good revit reader support um, they've just released the ability to write revit files now so if you're in that kind of civil construction space you know, you're looking at using a lot of data from autodesk bringing it in from their cloud you know and you actually want to start to output some of these revit files um, we've got that option there um, it's a little bit of a work in progress, so it's not everything that the Revit output format will support. Um, the idea is really that you can start to slim your models down. Um, so if there are functions in here that are missing um, that you want, do let SAFE know because they're really keen to kind of know which bits to focus on as they develop the right of more going forward. So it's pretty rich so far, but there's definitely some room for some extra bits. So if there's some bits you think are missing, just let us know and we can pass that on to SAFE because um, they're quite keen for that user feedback for these ones. And then there's a few new transformers that have kind of snuck in over the last release. So if you've got 2023, 2023.1, um, there's a few new transformers that have come in that you possibly won't notice, um, but actually some of them are really useful. So there's a new unique identifier generator transformer that lets you generate UUIDs or GUIDs. So if you've created these previously using either those individual transformers, they've now been combined in this new um, combination transformer here. It also brings in the universally unique lexicology graph sortable identifier, which is more than a mouthful, um, which is again, just another way of creating unique identifiers. So if you do need to generate unique IDs for your data, you need to join things through as part of a workflow, this is a really good robust method for doing that. The other one that I quite like is the date time rounder, um, mostly because FME always uses fractional seconds. So if you're generating a lot of timestamps with FME, it's always putting them in as fractional seconds, which is always slightly annoying because you don't really probably need to measure to quite that level of precision with most things. So this just gives us that ability to round up timestamps quickly and easily without a lot of hassle to the nearest hour, the nearest um, minute, the nearest second, et cetera. We can also do it on intervals. So we could actually say it's every four hour blocks, for example. Um, this also means that if we're starting to do more analytics on real time data, we can actually start to round up our data to group it together a little bit more. So we've just got a really simple example here that you can see is basically just a flight path. I picked something off flight 24, pulled their flight path data down. So we've got individual timestamps, you know, at every few seconds coming through. But if I wanted to do some analytics on that kind of real time data, that's not really great. So I just threw it through the date time rounder. And you can see that I've broken this down by an hourly um, process through. So it's about 10 hours, I think it takes to go through. 
but you can see now when we've started to build the stats you can see obviously our t01 you know the aircraft sat on the ground it's probably taxiing it's only moving at about 12 knots so it's not really quick but obviously as you move through those timestamps, we can start to see we've got the times for the altitudes the speed as it actually goes through different parts of the flight and obviously then coming into that landing profile so if you're looking at tracking vehicle information you're looking at tracking sensor information coming in from smart devices you know iot devices we can bring that in we can use that same sort of concept and say what was the average temperature for these particular timestamps what was the average flow load on this particular part of our network within these kind of hourly times so um, you know it's got a few uses and it's kind of quietly snuck in but actually with a lot of this real-time information it's got a lot of power behind that um, i could have aggregated that into larger chunks as well rather than just hourly i could have gone for four hourly windows to really break that data down so from an analytics point of view and actually helping to you know manage the data flow that comes in from iot you know it's always referred to as a fire hose of data you know it's a really helpful transformer for actually starting to manage some of those processes and the other one i really like and i've missed for many a year in fme is this new classifier transformer so what it will let you do is classify your numeric data by natural breaks your quantiles or your equal intervals and actually then assign that to a different class number so if you're familiar with GIS you've probably looked at this in the likes of QGIS in the likes of ESRI and it's just standard out of the box stuff um, it's never really been in FME as an out of the box capability you always had to kind of build this yourself to do it so this is a really nice transformer for actually helping to start to classify your data so again if you're looking at reporting wanting to output your data to a more visual kind of profile it's a really handy way of just building these classes directly into your data flows now you know without any real hassle so we can take things like the quantile data i took our crime data set that's that four and a half million records classified it into four groups so we can see basically which are the red which are the top level or higher crime counties versus down to green for the lower crime counties and obviously then we can start to render that up in our map as our output um, as you go through so really helpful just as a nice quick win and kind of snuck in um, but it's a really powerful transformer for helping with these sorts of things um, as we go through how, how does it uh, break them up gavin is it is it uh the number of classes is it, is it just taking an equal uh range or is so there more settings to it than that then so it depends on the option you choose. So equal intervals is literally just saying, well, oh, I'm going to take okay. you know, 0 to 10, 10 to 20, yeah, to 10 yeah, to 30. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't really reflect your data or doesn't stretch your, your data. Quantile is, if I remember this correctly, it's the top 25%, then the next 25%, yeah, quantile, the middle, yeah, and then yeah. the bottom 25%. So it naturally breaks your data. And natural breaks, I think, is an algorithm that tries to find natural breakpoints within your um, data set. Yeah, you know, I, 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 yeah, I've used some, some of them somewhere on G Media, but yeah, I was wondering how, how, yeah, it's a very simple looking dialogue. So I was wondering how it, uh, how it, they were breaking it. So it's, you know, those three options there: the natural breaks, the quantile, or equal intervals. Then that yeah. sets up your, 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 your ranges. Okay, okay, very good. Yeah, so very good. Um, I know they're standard ones, and it's maths, and that's never been my strong point. So I just accept <laughs> that it works. And <laughs> okay. With things like the equal intervals, you do have the number of glasses you can yeah, choose. Yeah. Yeah. your number so it's it is very much like if you picked up QGIS it's the basically the same kind of settings you'd see there as Regia Media and things as you go through yeah, yeah, yeah. so oh, definitely yeah yeah cool and they say one of the big things that's safe for pushing for and I think it's something we're going to see a lot more of is just making you more productive in FME and making it easier to use the product to make you faster to get through processes so that you're battling um FME really to do something quite simple so it's to make it easier one of the big new ones that's come out and is going to be a little bit controversial i think for some people is the new ai assistant so everybody's talking about ai this is the big thing for this year it will be the big buzzword and you've probably seen things like microsoft are releasing copilot to sit alongside you when you're working um so say for doing the same thing with fme so we can now embed some of this ai technology in I must admit, I was a little skeptical when they first announced it, but having played around with a few of these, it's actually really good. Um, so with this one here, I've got air codes in my data set, which is fine, but I'm never really sure if those air codes are valid or not. So I can come in, 
within the tester, I can actually create a test that says, check if my air code is valid using regular expressions. Now, if anybody's ever used these, they'll know that they are an absolute nightmare to create, but they've now put in an AI assistant. So I can literally come in and go, not really sure what I want to do, but if I explain to the AI what I want my regular expression to do, it will go off and actually generate me the regular expression that I need. Um, so it basically just saves a bunch of Googling. So it's really kind of almost as though you're embedding your Google prompt within FME to go through. I can just put that in, generate. It's going to give me a warning because it is going to send some information to a third party. So again, from a data protection point of view, you're going to want to think a little bit about what you're doing, where you're sending that information. But you can see there it's generated wow. the regular expression. It's given me some test examples, and it also gives me a bit of an explanation, which is quite nice, because otherwise it's basically just voodoo looking at those numbers. I have no idea. So I can apply them in, click OK. I've got my regular expression now. If I run my tester, it's going to quickly test my data set. And it's going to come through, and I can see that I've got 79 records there that don't actually meet the kind of air code standard or specification to go through. So it's really, really yeah. useful. That's very cool. And is that across many features? Is that across that AI assist? Is it is it um is it just on a certain ones like the regex or how so does it work? On the kind of more developer ones currently. So it's built into the regular expressions one, which I think is probably the one most people find most useful because they are just complicated yeah, yeah. at times. And to be able to put them in, it's really helpful. Um, it's also in the SQL assistant. So again, uh, okay. if you're like me, who vaguely remembers how to write a SQL <laughs> query, but I always have to go and double check because I'm never 100% sure, Yeah, I can come in, I can write what I want my SQL query to be. And again, it's just be mindful that you can send the database schema to the AI, but you are sending that to a third party. It's basically the open AI consortium, so it's the same as ChatGPT. Mm. So it's a little bit of a black box. So you know, you may want to be thinking, well, actually, is there anything sensitive in my schema? Do I want to use that? And you know, just you can choose that accordingly as you go through. So if it's unticked, which it is by default, it doesn't send anything to ChatGPT or OpenAI. If you tick it, it will send the schema and things along to the background for you. Um, so you know, if your schema is not particularly sensitive, it's open data or it's just very generic, that'll give you a slightly more accurate answer. You can see here though with this AI one, I've got you know select table one, table two. I've got a description again down the bottom so I can understand what it's trying to do. And you know, I can obviously substitute these in for my own table names as I go through. So you can make it a little quicker by submitting the schema, but obviously it's just a little bit more sensitive. So you can choose. And again, you can up and down vote it. So if you think the answer was really good, you can give it a thumbs up, which is helping safe understand which answers were good, bad. If it was absolute rubbish, which it will give you sometimes, you know, you can give it a thumbs down based on that. Um, I think it's like all of the AI things, it's down to how good your prompt is. So if you write a good prompt, it will give you a good answer back um, as you come through. And then the other one that it's in is the Python callers or the Python creator. And this one actually has a few more modes. So in this case, we can get it to generate code for us based on the description. We can get it to refine our code. But the one I quite like is the explain code. So if I find a bunch of Python code, which I actually did in the workspace while well, we're pulling together. Somebody had created it. They'd put a whole bunch of Python into a workflow. We were looking going, well, what do all these Python bits do? I can actually now run it through the AI. And again, it's going to explain what that code's actually doing for me. So it's a quick way of actually helping you understand, you know, maybe a bit of code that you found in a workspace that somebody's created. You know, you're not really sure what it's doing. I can quickly get that explanation through. I can also add comments. So, you know, if you're like most of our developers, they hate putting comments against stuff. You know, again, you can run that through and it'll add in some comments for you as you go through. So it's really powerful. Um, it's probably very much early days. It is still in that kind of tech preview stage. So they are ironing out all the bugs, the issues and things. So if you come across problems, again, always let us know. But I think it's going to be quite an exciting area because you know, where AI really does start to add value is in these sorts of things, but how does it make you more productive? You know, how can we actually start to solve some of our challenges a little bit quicker rather than, you know, Googling and then having to find the first answer of Stack Overflow or something and then looking that up? You know, now it's all embedded, so it's going to save you time. Um, you can also start to access all the open AI transformers. 
So there are some actual packages that let you access open, API, or open AI or basically chat GPT directly. Um, you can also access the Microsoft implementation of it as well. So if you're more of a Microsoft house, you can go direct to Microsoft and use them. And you know you can start to put in a chat GPT connector. You can do image generation. We've got this completions connector as well. So that one always escapes what it actually does, but I think it can, helps you complete existing content that you've got through. Um, and there's also a reader, so you can use it from straight from an um, AI prompt here as part of a workflow. So I was really bored. Um, one of our users is quite into Power Automate. So I just got it to basically set up a rap battle between FME form and um, Power Automate, and it will spit you out all of your content. As I say, your usage for this may vary in terms of how valuable it's going to be. Um, certainly things like um, processing addresses, you know, if you wanted to pull an air code out, for example, or pull out address information, again, you can start to use the GPT connectors to do that, to actually help pull out that information. And it's really successful on those sorts of things. Um, the only thing to call out is obviously this is an API, so there are some costs associated with this. So, you know, it's going to be very low cost to do 10, 20 addresses. If you put a million addresses in there, you'll obviously want to think a little bit about um, your spending and whose credit card it is. The other really interesting one that's come in, it's a little more niche, is the HTTP call has now been expanded to import open API specifications. So this is different from open AI. So open API is about, if you have a web service, defining what that web service looks like in an open standards way so that other systems can easily integrate from it. So we can import that API specification and then start to access all the methods and things within the HTTP caller. And I think this is laying the groundwork for some interesting stuff that's going to come in 2024 with SAFE. So we have Map Enterprise from Hexagon that has a rich API that we can use. So I actually created this one or pulled this one in from it. Um, it has a YAML file that it gives you, which is basically just its description file. So we can now import this, bring this into FME, and it will give me every single method for post operations, put operations, get operations and things. So we were looking at some imagery work. So I can just come in here now, find that imagery API, and it sets it all up. So I'm not scrambling around with documentation, trying to work out what's there, remembering how to, which bit goes where. You know, I can quickly come in. We've put some security things in as well for it. But essentially, all that API information is there available. And if I need to quickly interact with one, this is a really, really useful tool. And I think more and more systems are API based these days, more and more users are trying to access API information. So if you can get that open API definition, it makes putting those APIs into FME so much easier um, when we're going through. So this is going to be quite a useful one. A little bit more niche, it's kind of hidden away there, but it's definitely worth remembering. Um, and then the other big one that's come in, at least 2023 has given it a refresh, is comparing workspaces. Um, we've had a couple of the guys recently working on projects. They found this really useful to see what they thought the workspace was going to be versus maybe that somebody else has gone in and started tinkering with it, especially if you're working with customers. They may have made some changes. They could quickly do a side by side comparison on this and say, oh, actually, this is exactly what we've got here. So you can come in here and see like the spatial filter. It's a little bit blurry here, but you can see the settings are being flagged up for being changed. Um, if we've got new readers, so we have a new reader just off to the right here that's replaced these two data inspectors. So it'll break down in a really granular detail um, all of the differences between them now. So it's really, really useful. If you've played with this in some of the earlier releases, it was a little clunky. It's probably the nicest way I can put it. Um, I always struggled to kind of use it a little bit. It wasn't the most user friendly. Safe have taken that feedback on board and they've given it a real refresh for 2023. So it's much nicer to use. And actually, this is going to be really, really useful, I think, in a lot of use cases because it's really easy to lose track of which version is which. You know, this lets us compare the two, see what the differences are. And we can push changes from one of these workflows into the other workflow as well. So it makes it really, really powerful. Really so improves that DevOps experience, Gavin, doesn't it? Because yeah. yeah, that you can have multiple people working on flow lines and versions and everything, and, and and not having to figure out which versions in production, which was in test, and and the GitHub integration as well. So yeah, yeah. that's very it, very cool. 
yeah and it's so easy to get them confused or if you're like me i end up with five different versions of the workspace i've saved into different parts of my desktop or into my downloads folder etc so now i can go oh okay compare the two of them this is where the differences are so you can quickly see you know we've got 15 changes between the two workflows what's on one side of the reader so you can see we've got the autocad's been added in on the right hand side there it's not present on the left hand side so that's for the writer that's come through um, we can see the transformers the user parameters in there have been changed we can break down that even things like the connection paths um, we can come through and see there as well so an awful lot of um, content it's say so it's a little bit intimidating because it is so fine-grained but you can turn off um, what you're interested in so we can see there we've got the two differences between the settings for the spatial filter so under the controls there i can go in and say well actually i'm only interested in looking at the transformers that have changed the writers that have changed um, etc as you go through and if you want to bring a change across you know if i wanted to bring that inspector through i can just click on that there it's going to just say do i want to replicate it as a confirmation and it moves that over and recompares it um, I also then have to reconnect it or I can actually bring through the connection path. So it does treat the two separately. Um, so it's something just to bear in mind. And again, this is going to go through that same process and does the recompare. So again, we can just bring those in and it will update kind of the diff file essentially as we go through. So I think it's going to be a really helpful one as users get to that version to start to understand what is going on. And then the big one that's probably going to be a little more niche um, is that there is finally Git integration directly from the command line. So this is a little interesting, and it's definitely one that if you use Git, you're going to love. And if you have no idea what Git is, you're going to be a little bit kind of like, oh, what's the point? Um, but it's basically just letting you do version control directly, which is very much into that whole kind of continuous integration process. So we can come in, we can use the command line to look at that. I can check out a new branch. So basically, I can say, well, I want to work on this workspace but i only want to make some edits to it so i can come in i can check that out directly from command line i can go into where for me you know, i can make my changes and you could do this from the desktop tool it doesn't have to be directly from command line but there's a couple of extra tweaks they've added in that do make this a little bit more interesting going through so if i'm just going to add my inspector And then what I can also start to do is I can do all the differencing as well. So that kind of traditional diff that you would see when you commit back as part of a Git-based workflow, it will show you that before and after actually against your repository. I can now do that directly from command line and again, launch FME, and it will give us back that Git compare view that we were kind of just looking at previously. So the compare tool is nice and easy. Anybody can really use that one. That's kind of designed for the mass user. This command line version is much more based around you having more of a Git-based workflow for more of a development approach. So if you are using these sorts of tools, then this just means you can easily integrate FME into that kind of workflow now. It makes it much more simple um, to build in. But I say, if you're not somebody who uses Git in a lot of detail like that, don't panic. The, go, um, the compare tool is much simpler. Um, and is probably your go-to. But I say this has been the top most asked thing in F4 and FME for the last five or six years, I think. So they're finally adding it in. Um, it's a little tricky to set up. So again, if you're interested in doing it, you've got questions, again, always just reach out to us um, to go through. And then just on flow, this one I actually really like. It's been something I've been wanting for a long, long time. It's really simple, but in the automations, you can now see how many messages have been passed between the different components so if you think of desktop you can see the number of features flowing through exactly the same thing but just for the automations and stuff going so just gives you a little bit more information about what's flowing around how many features have flown through your um, workflow and things so really really simple but i think that's going to actually be quite a helpful one for people to see and use and then just back to desktop the feature information window's just been rejigged so one of the things I think has always been a bit confusing for users is this concept of exposed and unexposed attributes. So unexposed attributes are maybe you've connected to a web service or we've got a list element here for the open sky one. And it brings in data, but they're not actually defined as attributes on the canvas. So therefore they've got FME terms of unexposed ones. 
and they would all kind of get mixed up in the feature information window it wasn't obvious to see where they'd come from they've rejigged it now just to make it a little more obvious so you can see these are the attributes that you would see on the canvas but these are also attributes that your feature has but aren't exposed on the canvas so you can see that all these unexposed ones in here so it's just making it a little bit more clear about what's going on and what sits where within that workflow to make it easier so again it's quite a minor one but i think it's just going to make life a little easier for people especially if you're starting to learn fme um, and see what's going on they've also slightly rejigged things like the geometry um, you'll notice some of the information is now down the bottom where it traditionally would have been at the top so they're kind of prioritizing the attributes which is what most people are generally interested in um, and then bringing all the sort of geometry elements combined down to the bottom there as you go through so um, it's a slight tweak but i say it's going to make life a lot easier i think for a lot of people and then one big new one you may have come across if you're using an older version of fme recently um, is the stamen maps that have kind of been a staple background map for a lot of users who haven't wanted to use the esri maps or a map um, box kind of base layer um, has been switched off essentially um, the company hosting those tiles no longer wants to do it but they have teamed up with another company so that's caused obviously safe a bit of a problem because if you're using those maps currently in any version earlier than 2023.1 you know you're not going to be able to access them they are going to disappear there's a you'll see a bunch of error messages coming up on the tiles themselves saying i think it was the end of october they were lasting too so you'll probably see them see them phase out now um so what safe have done is they've actually added in their own default base maps based off of um, the new company who's providing them so they've also added them in as default so no longer do you have to go through and set these up manually you can now actually just pick default light default dark or default terrain which is that one on the right hand side there and they're just out the box so again it's going to make it much easier just to get a quick base map in if you need it you know if you've done a new install you just want to set a base map on you know you can quickly just pick one of these default options now in 2023.1 you can still add all of your esri maps your bing maps your map box, WMS, WMTS services in there if you want to, you know, just as you would have done before. It just means we've got some nice kind of out the box ones we can use without having to mess around. So again, if you start to see some error message, if you're using that free kind of base map, um, that's the reason why. So unfortunately, you will have to upgrade or find an alternative base map. But if you're up to 2023.1, um, you're good to go. Let's say the other part is about accelerating project delivery. You know, to make you faster as you're going through so one of the nice new things that's in 2023 is if you're using projects you can now actually see what that project content is so you know if maybe we've created something for you we're sharing that with you when you import it onto your system you'll now get a nice breakdown of all of the components that actually make up that project so again you can step through see is it a new user that's coming in it's a new repository maybe a new token so again it's a quite a simple one but it was always a bit of a black box operation never really sure what you were going to import so this just gives you a lot more granularity about what's there um, there's also a new package developer sdk and this comes into you know the fact there's a lot more apis out there now that you might want to use so we can actually start to create our own transformers in fme so we've created this simple one here you'll see that when you add it it comes up now as an fme transformer does get flagged as a community transformer so you can differentiate them a little bit but it just means if you've got a particular burning desire to work with an api and you're working with the api a lot or there's certain blocks of functionality you want to use you can now create your own package so you'll have seen these with some of the transformers like the email lab that safe have released they're opening up this program a little bit wider so again if this is something you're interested in um, it's definitely worth reaching out to us, you know, because it's probably possibly something that we can build for you um, as a service, you know, rather than you having to learn some of the intricacies that sit behind it. It's a little bit more complex than, say, a traditional custom transformer. But, you know, if you've got a particular API that you're on to interact with, you want to make it really simple, you know, this is a perfect option for that. So we've just been building a test weather service one here. So you can see, you know, we can put an API key in, we've got the coordinate system. So all those parameters that your API would traditionally take, you know, we can make these as parameters in the transformer. So it's very, very easy to interact with. And it's really extending that concept of the Esri 
um, online connector, the SharePoint online connector, um, the Autodesk online connector, et cetera, that there, the email transformer, you know, it's a nice simple wrapper onto more complex APIs. Um, there's a new transformer UI builder and there's Python code sits behind this. So this is where this moves into more of a developer territory um, for producing them. So these aren't, you know, something you can quickly build. There's a little bit of effort creating them, but it's a really new or useful tool. So I can say if it's something that you know, you're battling with certain APIs and you think actually be really good to have a transformer that would take care of this, yeah, say reach out to us and send us something as you know service that we can help you guys build that through um, and deliver that. There's also some enhancements to the quick search, um, really just to reflect some of these changes that are coming through. So you'll see that we've got transformers now marked as official. So you can quickly see if a transformer is an official safe one. For example, how many times that transformer has been downloaded for some of these custom transformers. So you can see if it's a really popular one or if it's maybe one that nobody really uses, if it's installed. And you can also then see community ones. So these are the ones that the community have built and have deployed up onto the FME hub. So you can say, okay, well, actually, maybe I'm going to trust the one from SAFE as being a fairly authoritative transformer. This one here, oh, I have no idea who Jamie Gillis is. I don't know if his work's really good, if it's really poor. You know, I might do a little bit more testing around that to make sure that's going to be valid for what I want. Now, I'm assuming 246 people have found this transformer quite useful. So therefore, it's probably a case of, oh, actually, that's probably fairly robust, or at least it's a popular concept. So again, you know, trust that one maybe a little bit more than maybe that's got two or three downloads is a bit more niche. And one of the other big things that's come in around this continuous integration and sort of more of this DevOps space is deployment parameters. And I think these are ones that are going to take people a little bit of time to get their heads around, but I think people are going to really like. So the idea is that if you're creating a workspace that needs to run on FME Flow, you now you're going to have a bunch of deployment parameters. It might be database connections, for example, web service connections, parameter information that you really want to standardize and put somewhere central. So what we can do now is put those parameters up into FME Flow or FME Server, and then we can bring those down. So when we're authoring a workspace, we can actually connect to them. So if I've got my production workflow or my DevOps um, workflow or my test connections for different databases, I can set all those up on the server. And then when I'm building my workflow, I can make sure I'm connecting to those parameters so that I'm going to have consistency between the experience on FME Flow and the experience on FME Desktop. You know, naming conventions are going to stay the same and everything's going to be more consistent. So it's going to make moving between different environments much, much easier. So as you know, people get more and more into this kind of deployment infrastructure as code type environments, you know, this is all the kind of things that are really going to help um, leverage some of those capabilities. So what you'll see from the deployment parameters is we end up with this new little section here, if there are any that have been set up on your system. And I can start to link these through. So I've got things like I've set one up for the notifications for email, the host name, the port name, so that if I need to reference those anywhere in my workflow, you know, I'm not having to recreate them each time. I can standardize on those, link them in, and make sure I've got those settings for you know, maybe my prod environment or my test environment and my production environment. And again, I can create local overrides for testing. So if you've ever used the FME flow parameters when you're creating workspaces, and if we've been talking about using things like the shared resource data folder in a workflow, you know, again, you'll be familiar with that, being able to override the setting to put that as a local development environment um, as we run through. So same sort of concept, just extend it out with more consistency um, as it runs in. Also means they refreshed some of the FME connection details as well, which is actually quite nice. Um, they've simplified the kind of wizard for connecting to FME now. So if you're used to connecting to FME Flow, FME Server, you know, you'll be familiar with the, you know, I can click on the icon here to create and publish a workspace, you know, to download a workspace. You'll now see we've also got this list of connections. And if that connection is active, you'll get this nice little green logo. So I can click on here and choose you know, my different environments that I've got. 
that I want to connect to. So again, I might want to connect to my production environment, my test environment, and then FME knows which one it's connected to. Those deployment parameters will also reflect that environment. Again, you'll see this be green in that case. Um, if it's red, it means it can't connect to them. So there's no connection there um, as you run through. But also once I do want to publish, I've got a nice simple interface now. So I can come in, I can choose quickly which connection I want and it's going to show me my repository. So it's just minimizing the number of clicks to get through parts of this workflow. So again, quite a small change, but just is actually a really nice user experience. Um, it just saves you having to click through a lot of things that probably weren't very relevant initially. So it's much faster to use. Um, so I really like this one. It's quite painful to go back to some of the older versions where it's not in there. So it's just really those little usability tweaks and making you faster at doing these things. Um, the other one that's come in on the sort of parameter side is conditional parameters. So what that means is when we select parameters for maybe an FME server app, um, or FME flow app rather, or in a workspace or in a transformer, I can make them conditional. So in this case, you know, I've got my geometry required. If I'm selecting yes, I can show spatial formats. So if I come in here, you know, just as a practical example, I can say, is my geometry required? Yes, and I'm going to get options around what spatial format do I want? What coordinate reference system do I want coming in here? And I can choose those. If I say, well, actually, I'm not really interested in the geometry. I don't care about this whole geo stuff. You know, I can give that a whole different list. So I can start to tailor my parameters for the sorts of questions that I'm asking or for the sorts of users that I'm targeting. And all it really means is I can set all these up in the parameter manager and I now have this new conditional visibility. And I can say that if the domain one is set to yes, then hide the spatial formats or show the spatial formats. And if I've got my non-spatial one, that's gonna be the domain set to no. And you can build this out to be as complex as you want as you go through and start to build these um, out. So it's gonna make this much more user-friendly. It's gonna be a little bit more like if you're used to using survey one, two, three, and you've got the conditional parameters there, it's gonna be a lot more closer to that kind of user experience. Um, what's not in yet, but it should hopefully, touch wood, be in 2024, is making these lists dynamic as well. So they're able to pull in from a service to make the list um, adaptive. So rather than it being static, um, that should hopefully be coming in as well um, next year. So the premise is going to be much, much richer. The whole user experience for building server apps and the flow apps um, is going to get a lot better, I think, with these and some of the changes that are coming forward. So again, it's going to make building your workspace, serving this out to your end users so much easier. Yeah, that is excellent, isn't it? That's that, that's for those data entry forms. That's going to be really powerful, isn't it, Gavin? Yeah. Yeah. To be able to select them, that's a little bit of work setting them all up. But once you've mm -hmm. built them, that's going to give you that consistent user experience from desktop through to the flow apps and stuff on server. So, yeah. And again, like, no code. Yeah. Absolutely no programming. It's literally just come in, choose them. You know, all just clicking through in the user interface. And then the other one that's come through that's going to be probably quite useful, I think, for a lot of people, that maybe take a little time just for you to get your head around, is the Attribute Manager now lets you define data types. Um, again, this has been something a lot of people have wanted for a long time. Um, and it basically means that within the Attribute Manager, I can now create a defined schema. So previously, FME just didn't really care too much about the data type of the data that was flowing through the process. It was always kind of saw it in a fairly generic data type. And it was only when you got to the writer, you would start to define what you wanted it to look like as you were going through. We can now come in and actually say that I want my name to be Varchar 200, or I want my name to be Varchar 20. So you'll be able to see as part of your workflow that if you change this to Varchar 20, you know, I'm going to truncate my data you know, nice and early on in your workflow process. It's not going to be that last bit where you suddenly, everything's working perfectly. You go to run it to the database and suddenly find that you've got the wrong data type for the particular format that you're looking for or field that you're targeting. You know, you can now start to catch some of these a little bit earlier. So it also means that from building the schema, I can make my feature writers a little bit easier. So I've got, you know, GeoDirectory here. I've joined up three different tables. So I've got a whole host of attributes. I can now use the attribute manager to actually manage that schema. 
So it makes my whole schema management process much, much simpler. I can get rid of attributes. I can create new ones. I can define what I want that data type to be. You know, I can import that from an existing feature cache. I can rename stuff. But now when I come to the feature writer, because I've set everything up, I don't have to recreate it here. I can just click on automatic. FME will pick up that definition that I've defined in the attribute manager and then use that to, as actually part of that feature writer definition. So I'm not having to go into the feature writer, spend ages creating it all there. You know, I can do it in the attribute managers as I need to, and I can build that anywhere within the workflow. So I can set up you know, new attributes that I'm creating. I can already set them to be the right data type so that when they arrive at the writer, everything's correctly set up. So again, it's something that's quite simple, but actually is going to be really, really powerful and it's going to save quite a bit of time messing around with worrying about, do I have the right data sizes, the right schemas and things going through? So it's a small tweak to the attribute manager, but really, really powerful one as it's there. And then we've also got options to deploy everywhere. So I shall let Kieran explain this one. All right. Um... Tell me to, to, to share screen there, Gavin. Yeah, yeah. I uh, just like give give you a break from uh, uh, <laughs> presenting. Yeah, uh, share, and I'll flick to this. So I think this okay. one's going to be a really powerful one as well about helping users use the data more efficiently. No, oh, hundred percent. Yeah. So um, as we know, today is the data is larger, faster, more varied, and more distributed than ever before. So yeah, we're going to have data on premise. We're going to have data in hybrid clouds. You know, various clouds, and all. And, and even when it, it's very simple to talk about the cloud being, you know, this this one place. But actually, when you know, at the end of the day. The cloud is just data centers somewhere, and in some cases, most of them are in Ireland. But you know, you've got data centers; they have to physically reside somewhere. So, with data, there is a need now to have increased efficiency so that you can process your data wherever it resides and eliminate that network latency and data transfer. And then being able to deploy your processing so that you know your processing resides where your data is, so you're meeting your data residency rules. And again, data security and data compliance is so much more important. So with FME remote engines, you can actually deploy the FME process in the region you need beside the data. So again, as I mentioned, with the cloud, it is just data centers somewhere in the world, or they are physically residing somewhere. And if you have your your data pipeline in one location and your data storage in another, you're going to get this data latency. You're going to get these data delays. So you need an efficient way to have your processing and your data in the same location, in the same area, and running through the same security. So with the deploy to any or road of engines from FME now, you can have engines on premise with your data and you can have the remote engine service inside your clouds or wherever they are in things like Azure or working with um, Esri or whatever it is you want to be able to work with. Um, also things like Snowflake. So bringing these engines close to the data to ensure the optimum performance of your data pipelines. Also, just to keep things moving as well, Sysense with this kind of distributed deploy anywhere architecture, now you can control all the licensing from FME flow. Again, means it easier to deploy your distributed processing as opposed to licensing each engine separately. And it's disposable and transient process, processing can happen where you need it. From a performance point of view, um, you know, we have the aggregator now has gone from for some data from one hour to just over six minutes. Uh, the area and area overlayer is two times faster and, and even seen examples where it's 70 times faster. Surface clipping, again, examples with a large candidate mesh that's 110 times faster and 3x in performance improvement or up to 55 for raster clipping. So again, say if I have a, an ongoing need in every release to improve performance and speed things up, which is really useful. Um, and again, clipper curve area clipping 17 times faster and clipper area clipping, yeah, you can see the numbers are running a bit late, so I'll speed up a wee bit. Um, so that brings us uh, to our end and to our questions. Um, 
I'll stop sharing for a second. The uh, we do have a couple of questions there, Gavin. Uh, if you can, I'll read them out to you. I tried to answer one, but I probably wrong, so I'll make sure I, I was given. So uh, we were asked, can the Parquet reader actually point to a CSV file? And I was saying no. We would point FME to the CSV, and it would write the Parquet. Is that a that's correct? right? Yeah. So with the Parquet ones, it's a format in its own right, so it's just the same as any other reader. It's just it's more performant than the CSV. So it's kind of a replacement for CSV files in general. So actually those um, Parquet files I created, I took the source CSV because there's 600 megabytes of CSV files, there's about four and a half million record features. And I just converted that CSV into the Parquet because it was gonna be quicker to work within the rest of my workflow. So I did that as a conversion. So we can create those new Parquet files so again, if you're doing big data and you need to push that into other systems, so if you wanted to load it into Snowflake, for example, into things like SciSense, you know, we can bring that data in more efficiently now using those Parquet um, formats. So it's it's an alternative to CSV, but obviously you can turn your CSVs into your Parquets rather than having the Parquet point at the CSV. Great. And then another question is from Dara. Um, what do the tokens relate to on AI assist? I'm assuming it's something to do with the licensing, is it? Yeah, so it's back to backing the um, way the OpenAI API works. So the tokens are basically how many characters you put in because the length of your query determines how much work they have to do on the back end. So that's kind of how they license it. So those tokens are based on basically how long your string is. Now you as a user in the safe provided AI don't really need to worry too much about that. Um, it just sits there as part of the system and it will run. So you can make your query you know, long or as complex as you need it to be. But if you start to use the, your own open API transformers, it's just something to bear in mind. Um, if you're using your own account, for example, there's also different, the open API connect, open AI connector, will also talk to the different ChatGPT models. And there are some cheaper models and there are some more expensive. So ChatGPT4, I think is more expensive than ChatGPT3. And there's a turbo version that's quicker, that again, uses less credits because on the back end, it's doing less processing to generate you your answer. So again, you can scale that to what you think is appropriate. But yeah, with the FME ones, it's really just about how long your string is and how expensive that query would be to run on the back end. But yeah, you don't need to worry as a user currently in the product. Okay, so, okay I think we're, 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 and I will see if any other questions come in, but in the meantime, uh, we'll start to wrap up. the um, Today, Gavin, just let everybody know, your your, your, your webinar is out. You're going to do, you're supporting another webinar this evening with our friends in Safe Software. Uh, right. on, yeah, with Dublin City Council talking about the forms and the homes inspection app isn't that right at, at, at was it four o'clock that's it yeah four o'clock our time so yeah and it's still up on safe's website so if you want to attend and you haven't you can register on there and it's going through how we're using fme flow with sort of no code apps so how yeah. we can deliver the apps to actually to, out to users both as you know, the kind of inbuilt ones, but also how you can extend it and use FME as web service provider to actually drive a lot of your own applications as well. So it's kind of a successful one we've had with DCC rolling out their fix it platform. Definitely. And that'd be really good. And, and yeah, great to have it. I'm just, I'm just having a quick look here to see. Uh, oh, they don't have it on their upcoming, maybe because it's today. I can't see it, but we might see if we can throw it into the, into the, uh, into the link. Um, oh, uh, I was recorded. Yeah, no, it's not there. So uh, we might see if we can throw it into the link to people to afterwards. And just ourselves then as well. Uh, we've been having a good lot of webinars this year. I hope you've all enjoyed it. We've had great attendance. We have one more. Uh, so this time next month on the 6th of December, we're going to have our SciSense, which is our BI platform, its top features of 2023. So very similar to today. I think it's myself and Connor are going to do in that one. Um, yes, there will be the, ine uh, the inevitable chat GPT um, references as well, because they've built some stuff into their system as well for in the analytics to be able to push data out to the LLM and bring information in. But I'll actually say that the, the slick and the, the FME integration there is 
pretty slick now. It's very good. Um, okay, and then chat, I think. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Tanya. She put the link in for the no code app uh, webinar this evening. So that's great if you want to register for that here. Gavin and Garrett and uh, Mark from Dublin City and Don from Say Software. So I think hopefully it should be a really interesting webinar. So, um, Gavin, like, thank you for all your hard work today, putting all that together. I, I took the easy route and just did the start and the end. Um, but uh, some really cool features, guys. I hope, I think you will understand, I think you will appreciate Safe are really driving on and really meeting that low code or no code uh, drive of, for an ETL and data management platform. So it's really good. So, again, I like, thank everybody for coming this morning and giving us your time. If you have any other questions, please reach out to us. And thank Tanya for arranging everything in the background. Thanks, Gavin. All right. We'll see Pleasure. you all. Thank Pleasure. you. Bye-bye.